Hello and welcome to the group room where we're at the 34th annual CTRC AACR San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Where I'm so happy to welcome back Dr. Kent Osborne, Professor of Medicine and Molecular Cellular Biology, the Director of the Dan L. Duncan Cancer Center, and the Director of the Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and the Co-Director of the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Thank you so much for finding time. Well, thanks for having me. You've been a busy man, obviously, at a meeting that everyone is excited about because I'm hearing expressions like practice changing, uh, impacting the standard of care, and you're going to talk to us about breast cancer treatment a year in review as we reflect on last year's meeting to this, year, me, this year's meeting, <coughs> and what really uh, matters most to you as the co-director of this year's conference. I think this has been um, one of the best, if not the best, meeting from the point of view of, of the exciting science and clinical trial results that have been presented. Um, I'd, I'd probably think about three or four areas, probably three stronger areas that will be practice changing. Um, one is uh, the treatment of HER2-positive disease, where we've made a lot of progress in the past few years anyway with the introduction of trastuzumab that targets that particular protein. And uh, we, people have been studying combination of drugs to block the HER2 pathway more completely. And we've seen over the past year, and then again at this meeting, uh, some really exciting data at this meeting in metastatic breast cancer, where the addition of a drug called pertuzumab to trastuzumab was much more effective than trastuzumab by itself when combined to chemotherapy. So that's uh, one of the, uh, I think, practice-changing uh, papers that was presented. It was actually published in the New England Journal two days ago, and I think will have widespread application. Um, another one was another clinical trial called the Bolero II trial. And this trial took relatively heavily pretreated estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and it randomized them to a standard approach, which was treatment with another aromatase inhibitor called exemestane or aromacin. And then another group was, got the same exemestane plus a new drug that blocks a growth factor pathway that we think is involved in resistance to endocrine therapy. And that drug was called everolimus. Hard to say it. And that uh, trial also showed pretty dramatic and sizable effects of adding the everolimus to this group of patients who had been treated with many, many different therapies. Another very exciting result, and I think a result that will also be practice changing in a subset of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And then we also uh, had a whole series, I think it was four or maybe five studies, looking at these bisphosphonates or drugs that help to prevent breast cancer from tearing down the bone. And yes, we've sh shown a long time ago that it helps prevent tearing down the bone. And there are many fewer complications of bone metastasis in patients with breast cancer today than there was years ago when I first started in, say, the uh, mid-70s. But a doctor here in San Antonio, actually, an endocrinologist who studied cancer in the bone by the name of Greg Mundy, who unfortunately died, passed away this past year, um, showed that when you have breast cancer in the bone and you treat with these drugs, which we call bisphosphonates, they're like Fosamax that you can take for osteoporosis, um, that not only do you prevent the bone from being destroyed, but you also kill cancer cells. And that observation was made many years ago. And actually, a colleague of mine and, and I went to the drug company saying, let's look at this not only to keep the bone strong, but to help improve the outcome of patients. And it took years and years of negotiating and presenting more data. And finally, a series of trials have, has been completed now, looking at these drugs almost as you would look at adding chemotherapy to surgery in patients with breast cancer. And um, as I look at the data, and there are mixed results, but if you look, there's one consistent finding. And that is people who are for sure postmenopausal by either medical means where you can make them postmenopausal by using drugs that block the ovary mm -hmm. or truly postmenopausal naturally, that means meaning uh, five or 10 years after the menopause, say 55 or 60 years of age. 
These drugs seem to work, and they work by reducing the risk of recurrence of breast cancer, not only in preventing osteoporosis and weak bones, but preventing recurrence of breast cancer, not only in the bone, but other organs as well. Sort of a difficult to explain observation. But I think many people now are going to be thinking seriously about using these drugs in postmenopausal women in addition to their standard chemotherapy and hormone therapy um, for their disease. When we talk about uh, practice changing and um, how this meeting impacts the way women are going to be treated from perhaps this point on, what happens now within the community setting where the majority of, of cancer patients are seen and how long does it take to adapt change based on studies and data that comes out of the San Antonio meeting? There's a couple of issues here. First, some of the drugs that have shown this practice changing are not yet available. Hopefully they soon will be. Everolimus is available um, for other diseases because it's been shown to be effective mm -hmm. in, I think, kidney cancer. So that should be readily available, and I think the FDA is likely to approve it for breast cancer because of the trial, the Bolero II trial. Mm -hmm. And since the data were published in the New England Journal, a very widely read journal, and presented and covered widely by the press, I don't think it'll be very long before you see that kind of thing introduced into the community of physicians. Word spreads like wildfire. Um, the other study of pertuzumab plus Herceptin. That's going to take a little bit longer because pertuzumab right now is not available. It's been applied to the FDA and I think will become available shortly. And once that becomes available, again, with the wide coverage that the study has gotten, I think you'll see pretty rapid and widespread use of that uh, combination in patients with HER2-positive disease. Of the, uh, some of the earlier research that's been presented, what are the trials that are ongoing that you are now really focused on in, in trying to gather more positive data? The whole focus now, as you've probably seen yourself over the past decade, has been less and less run-of-the-mill chemotherapy, which works in some patients, so I don't want to denigrate chemotherapy mm -hmm. too much. But let's face it, it's relatively nonspecific. We're not picking out patients very well who will respond or who won't. Um, but the trend has been less and less chemotherapy and more targeted therapy. And by that I mean identifying what the genetic abnormality is in that particular patient's tumor and then treating that patient with a specific agent. The first example of that was estrogen receptor in breast cancer. We measure that. If it's there, we treat with a hormone therapy. If it's not, we don't. Um, well, we're now seeing that we can do that with other um, abnormal uh, genetic alterations like HER2 amplification. If a patient has HER2, we give them Herceptin. And now we're able to dissect the tumor even further down to the minute mutations that occur in critical genes in that tumor. And we're able to target those pathways. So I think that's the uh, future of breast cancer and cancer research, so-called personalized cancer medicine, where we identify the genomic abnormality and treat that patient specifically with a drug that blocks whatever pathway is driving that particular tumor. There were a few other interesting studies that, that came out that were not uh, sort of in the area of treatment, but there was the IOM uh, environment study. Again, a number of, you know, obesity and what you eat and, and, and starch and carbohydrates and, and all of those. So you have this sprinkling of, of other important information as it may impact breast cancer epidemiologically as well? Absolutely, and there, there's more and more data that what we eat and what we do affects our breast cancer incidence rates and other cancers as well. And, and um, the obesity epidemic is going to cause an increase in the risk of breast cancer and the increased rate of breast cancer. There's no question about it. It's been known for, I think, 40 years now that obesity was a risk factor for getting breast cancer. And that's been seen in every study. What's now been shown in several studies is that obesity is a risk factor for recurrence after you've had the diagnosis of breast cancer or gaining weight after the diagnosis of breast cancer is an adverse factor. And these are not small changes. They can be fairly significant changes. So um, we really have to work together, physician and patient, 
patients have to be told about these effects and not to gain weight and to continue to exercise and minimize alcohol consumption, all of which have been shown to relate to not only breast cancer incidence but breast cancer recurrence. And uh, physicians need to be knowledgeable about this and inform their patients about it and really work together to um, get over this hump of, of uh, uh, metabolic syndrome, which is what doctors call this syndrome of obesity that affects all parts of our body, not only the cancer risk, but cardiovascular and, and other diseases as well. So until next year, mm -hmm. this time, more from you. I hope you get some rest this weekend, and I hope you're feeling a real sense of pride for what was accomplished here. Well, thank you very much. I thank you very much, Dr. Kent Osborne, the co-director of the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, professor of medicine and molecular and cellular biology, director of the Dan L. Duncan Cancer Center, and the director of the Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Thank you.